And it is a distinct pleasure to introduce our Mount Castle lecture speaker, Dr. Thomas Schaller. Dr. Schaller is a professor of political science and chair at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Now in his 18th year at UMBC, he teaches courses in American government, including the US presidency, interest group behavior, and campaigns and elections. As my government students and Dr. Thornberry's students know, he is the author of The Stronghold, How Republicans Captured Congress But Surrendered the White House. And in this engaging book, Dr. Schaller analyzes the phenomenon of how and why Republicans have been so strong in the legislative branch, but have struggled to hold on to the White House. And this book has led to great discussions in, in my classes. He's also the author of another book, Whistling Past Dixie, How Democrats Can Win Without the South. I'll mention that he did a masterful job of explaining that book on the Colbert Report a few years ago. If you want an entertaining uh, view, I, I encourage you to Google Schaller Colbert Report uh, for an informative discussion. He has published many academic articles, too numerous to list here, and has also been a commentator for our own Baltimore Sun, as well as having articles published in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, and many other publications. I will also add that Dr. Schaller is a great follow on Twitter, at Schaller67, with lots, of, with lots about politics, UNC basketball, and especially his beloved Washington Capitals. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Thomas Schaller. Good evening. Oh, come on, you can do better than that. Good evening. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me here. I want to thank um, uh, your headmaster, uh, Henry Smythe, and uh, also, is he called Principal? Is that the right title? Uh, Rob Hubeck. And of course, uh, Matt Baum for that kind introduction. I'd also like to echo what Matt said about uh, Dr. Jerry Thornberry. Jerry, uh, he came to my uh, presentation or job talk, book talk at uh, Ivy Bookshop, I guess it would be January, right after the book came, maybe it was February, and cornered me after and basically said, you're coming to Gilman, and when he tells you you're coming to Gilman, you're coming to Gilman, apparently. So here I am. <laughs> uh, I, I've been on the campus before, but never in, uh, inside any of the buildings, and uh, you have quite a lovely facility here, and I think if you don't already know it, and your parents haven't reminded you of it recently, you're very fortunate to be here, and I don't mean in this room listening to me. And I'm going to assume everybody is here voluntarily, because that makes me feel a little bit better. Uh, they asked me to tell you a little bit about myself from a career arc standpoint, how I got to be here uh, tonight, but uh, more generally uh, professionally. And I'll give you a, just a brief glimpse into, into that. And then I'll sort of open with a few remarks about what I think the state of our politics are, drawing a little bit from the book. and to some degree the previous book, Whistling Past Dixie, and many of my writings um, in the sun and other places. I, I'm using all of my college degrees. Uh, I was an undergraduate communications major at SUNY Oswego in upstate New York, which is where I'm from. I'm first generation to go to college on either side of my family and pr proud of that and a product of state universities. I got a master's degree at Florida State and a PhD at UNC, and I will be watching my heels play basketball Friday in Annapolis against Temple. I'm excited about that. Um, and I taught at public universities, both at Florida State and UNC as a uh, graduate student and later at Ohio University, Binghamton University back in my home state and now in my 18th year here, here at UMBC. And so I've taught undergraduates uh, from a variety of backgrounds and uh, varying degrees uh, of ability and skill and talents and so forth and it's been a very uh, rewarding career. When I was your age, though, my hero, my dream was really to go to Syracuse University's Newhouse School of Communications and become the next Bob Costas. I really loved sports and still do, as Matt made pretty clear, I think, in the introduction. And that's what I wanted to be, a play-by-play -play announcer, a color commentator, a Mike Lupica-style columnist. And that's why I went to school for media and communication studies. And then I made the fatal error of getting talked into one night, maybe a little too late on some Friday night, 
in downtown on, uh, out with my buddies into running for student body president, and I did it, and I won, and I got the bug, and I'm still trying to get it extricated. And so basically, in a very roundabout way, I figured out a way to write about politics, which is very, not coincidentally, often you find horse race metaphors and boxing metaphors that proliferate in the language, language of sports and the people, or politics and the people who write about politics, because there is a bit of a sometimes blood sport quality to it. And I realized that the, my fascination with politics, and specifically American politics, was going to give me enough satisfaction to supplant my dreams of becoming the next Mike Tirico or, or uh, Bob Costas or any of the other num number of notables who came out of Syracuse University, my dream school in high school. And so I went on to get an advanced degree, too, obviously, in political science and became a teacher, and it's been a very rewarding experience for me. But early in my career, I wasn't particularly happy. And I guess I wasn't particularly happy because there's, I guess, something in me uh, if my mom were here, she would say, uh, your report cards always came back. Tom is very smart, but he never stops talking. He needs to talk less so the other students can learn. Uh, that was always like the comments. I, I realized I had a, a need to say something. And I felt a little bit unfulfilled as a political scientist writing you know, journal articles and doing you know, data analysis and collecting stuff and running regressions and producing a table for a journal article or a conference paper in a room with six people. And I felt I needed to have something to say. And I started to write a few invited op-eds for the Baltimore Sun and later for the Washington Post. And in fact, the moment that I really changed professionally and became more of sort of a public writer or a sort of D-level public intellectual was I wrote the analysis. I was asked by the Washington Post to write the analysis of the victory in 2002 of Gilman alumni, uh, and I believe his son is in the room perhaps tonight, uh, Bob Ehrlich, and how in a seemingly blue state, Bob Ehrlich was able to win the governorship. And I'd written some analysis for The Sun about three weeks before saying, you know, this election will not be decided by the historically three big counties, the big three of PG, Baltimore City, and Montgomery County. It's really going to be decided by the key five suburbs of the Baltimore metropolitan area, Baltimore County, uh, Howard, Hartford, Anne Arundel, and uh, ha uh, Howard, Hartford, I'm, I'm pulling a Rick Perry here, Howard, Hartford, Anne Arundel, and Carroll counties. And I said, if Ehrlich gets a certain amount here, and, or, Hill, or uh, Kathleen Kennedy Townsend doesn't get a, a minimum of this in Baltimore County, she's going to lose this race. And then it happened, and the Post called me and said, you called the race, now you can explain it. And boy, that really gave me the bug, you know? And I thought, this is what I should be doing. I should be writing about politics for a general audience, which can be kind of intimidating. Uh, frankly, and so that's how I started on this path of writing uh, political science for a broader audience, writing more a public intellectual, trying to figure out ways, and the students who've read the book, there's every once in a while you'll see I'll mention a political scientist or a study and so forth like that, and it gets a little data dense or whatever, but finding ways to sort of write between the two disciplines for a mainstream audience and an academic audience, and sort of working the political science in, sneaking it in. Uh, in behind the narrative. And so that's what I've dedicated myself to doing really for the last 10 or 15 years after I realized there was a place and an opportunity and a voice for me to write about politics and bring my sort of skills and, and knowledge as a social scientist uh, to a broader audience. And I'm encouraged, strongly encouraged for those who do follow politics that a lot has changed in that period, not that I am the uh, progenitor of it or whatever, but maybe just a part of it, there are a, a lot of people like me now from Nate Silver on down who are people with uh, strong methodological skills, academic backgrounds, and PhDs who are learning to write uh, for a public audience in a way that we were kind of siloed talking to other academics and then the political community and the commentators were talking to each other, but neither group was sort of informing each other. And I think our national discourse has changed a little bit, and for the better, uh, because we are learning as we're becoming sort of the nerd revolution that, you know, data and understanding things other than a back of the envelope uh, uh, cocktail party level conversation is insufficient, and we need people who can explain patterns in our politics and our uh, political behavior for both elites and masses. And so I like to think of myself as one of the people that's at that intersection of a, somewhat of a revolution in the way we study, think, talk, and write about a modern American politics. Which brings me to the status of American politics right now. And the status, unfortunately, is, I, I think, a little bit disconcerting and maybe even 
maddening. Uh, we have a political system that I think on various levels is broken. And it's broken in many respects because of partisanship and polarization and divergences uh, between red America and blue America, between left and right, liberals and conservatives, Republicans and Democrats. Uh, but is also broken at some more fundamental levels by structural problems in our uh, American system, including perhaps our bicameral system of government, our presidential system of government, the division of powers. Uh, one might even begin to question the wisdom of the founders and the structure of our government. They've created perhaps the formula for a dysfunctional government uh, because they didn't foresee the kind of divisions that we would have as a country when they were writing a constitution for a largely limited class of white uh, gentried uh, elites who might disagree on some regional things and some larger questions like slavery, which are not, of course, unimportant, uh, but they would mostly agree on ends and maybe disagree a little bit on means. Our country is fundamentally different from what it was 200 years ago, and I think it's a little bit harder now in a political system that is structurally designed to sort of slow or impede or thwart change, but instead to venerate it. And when you add on top of that layer, and citizens for the students who did read my book know that Americans actually like divided government despite their complaints about polarization, despite their complaints, complaints about the lack of bipartisanship, despite the, their complaints about gridlock and the inability to solve small problems, no less long-term and larger problems. I think when you overlay the partisan division as a sort of a extra constitutional check above and beyond the constitutional checks that the founders put in and have been in there since 1787, we find ourselves as a modern nation with, in many respects, a pre-modern governing system, uh, which is further paralyzed by our polarization and our inability, I think, in some cases, to see ourselves as one America in many respects. And I, I hope that this will change, and I think it will change uh, generationally. Uh, over time, but we are at an important crossroads where the demographic changes are particularly dynamic right now, and I think America or s parts of America view itself as looking at the country through a completely different lens, a foreign lens from their fellow Americans, and it's very difficult, I think, in our sort of 47, 47 nation where uh, most of the people uh, polls show have made up their minds about elections before the candidates are known or before the debates have been conducted or the issues are known or the platforms are even announced uh, that we have a situation where it's increasingly difficult for us to come together to solve major problems whether are, they are domestic or foreign or international in nature. Into that sort of modern political context of sort of the post-1968 party de-alignment and deconstructive period of literally my lifetime, I was born in 1967, I wrote a couple of books, one that looks at the party, uh, 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 the Democratic Party in the context of regionalism and the change in the South in the post-civil rights era from the Democratic stronghold that it used to be to the now obviously almost virtually landlocked Republican uh, area of dominance and the single most uh, dominant area for either party and specifically for the Republicans and wrote that book and sort of talked about how in the context of the Democrats they could figure out a way to win when effectively they are shut out now as Republicans had been from the Civil War until the Civil Rights era out of the same region, the South. The newer book, the book that you have been reading, is a little bit different take if you read the introduction the book focuses more on an what I call an ideological institutional argument. And the argument here is about whether in our area, era of protracted divided government, and we've had divided governments now for 70% of the last, of the post-war period, the last six decades, where no party on the national level has controlled the Congress, the presidency, uh, both chambers of Congress and the presidency simultaneously uh, for 70% of those 60 years, that does it make sense for one party, uh, in this case the Republicans, to be the Congress dominant and Congress centric party, and another party, the Democratic Party, to be the dominant executive party, presidential party, and I try to explain why I think that, strangely enough, makes sense uh, and may be sort of the new normal in American politics, which is ironic given those who know their history of the post-war period because it used to be the reverse. The Democrats used to be the Congress dominant party and, of course, the Republicans from 
Eisenhower through Reagan Bush were the presidential dominant party. And so pulling the lens back on those two books, essentially what I'm trying to get at is the partisan and ideological institute implications of our protracted party bifurcation, our lack of bipartisanship, the sorting out of the two parties, their polarization, uh, uh, and increasing polarization on both the elite level from their votes in Congress and on the mass level in terms of the self-identified people of w either party that trust m citizens and members of the other party. And almost every measure of either elite or mass partisanship, we have seen growing and growing polarization over the last 50 years and particularly the last 20 years. And so we are at a country that's not only at a crossroads, but is at a, sort of a loggerheads, if you know what that means. We've reached the point where it's very difficult for the government to function and operate in a way uh, that will build for the future, solve current problems, prevent future problems, invest in our future. And I don't know, uh, sorry to be the featured speaker and bring uh, bad news, but I think it's important to be honest uh, with young people. I don't know, at least in the very near term, that we are out of the woods yet. And so, as future leaders, which you certainly are, or many of you will be, um, we do need to sort of rethink how we govern ourselves, how we talk to ourselves, frankly, uh, in a world where we know increasingly people self-select uh, where they get their information and news and media. And so it's not surprising that people can't see eye to eye or even have a conversation when they don't agree on some basic facts about the state of affairs and government or what things we do or don't do, and certainly how well we do them or poorly and what can be done to improve the things that we don't do very well. And so the country right now on a national level, to a lesser degree, uh, but somewhat as well on the state level, has become a very polarized blue, right, blue red, left, right, liberal, conservative, Republican, Democratic country. And it's gonna take something to change it. And uh, I'll sort of conclude with this, and because uh, they asked me to, you know, only speak for about 15 minutes, so I can leave as much possible time for your questions. I, I teach a class in campaigns and elections, and we study polarization in great detail. We look at votes of the Senate and the House and see the historical patterns and the polarization there. We look at the decline of moderates in both chambers, which is mentioned in the book as we talked with some of the students in Matt Baum's class today. There literally is no U.S. senator between the most conservative Democrat and the most liberal Republican, where 35 years ago, half of the Senate was in between those two polls, right? And when we got to the end of my campaigns and elections class that I taught, it was either last spring or last fall, I forget, we tried to figure out how we would ever get out of this current state of polarization. And I said, let's just spitball this idea. We'll take any idea, however crazy it sounds, and we'll run up the flagpole and we'll argue them out. And I think the students, and we just kind of just took the white erase board and we threw up every idea we could. And then, just to get them up there, and then we started hashing them out. And so some of the ideas were like, well, there'll be a major catastrophic thing to happen in the United States, either a natural disaster or an attack, and that will unify the country. And we talked about that at some length, and then we realized, well, that just happened, right? And it didn't unify the country, and in fact, arguably, it divided the country further after 9-11. We talked about the possibility that there would be complete elite failure, and maybe we already have that, that the government would cease to function and we would have shutdowns and we would have an inability to pay our bills and balance our budgets and massive deficits. And I pointed out very gently, well, we already have that too. And that hasn't seemed to unify the country. Um, we talked about a citizen revolt, like perhaps the emergence of a third party or a citizen alternative movement that would upend the current bipartisanship and uh, the two-party duopoly and the fact that they complain about each other, but in the end they're kind of, um, you know, a deal with the devil uh, compromise to maintain the power of the political system as it stands with the Democrats and the Republicans. I mean, we do have one of the most stable two-party governments of any country in the world for a variety of reasons, mostly of which have to do with the structure of our elections, and I can explain that in the Q&A if you want. And we talked about the rise of a potential Nader movement or a Tea Party movement, but we've had that too, and it hasn't changed things. Some of the things we talked about maybe will change things. Uh, women are a majority of voters in the country, and maybe someday they'll be a majority of our leaders, and women do seem to work a little bit better together than men do. And so maybe the gender changes that are coming in this country 
will change the way we talk to each other and the way we work with each other. And I'm hopeful to a certain degree that that might be, though not a panacea or a cure-all, that might be a means to changing the way we conduct ourselves politically. The point of all this is when we got to the end, and I can't remember all six or seven, I didn't write them down, I'm just remembering off the top of my head. The students were as stumped as I was, and I don't think we came up with an answer, and I don't know that it's my job to come up with an answer, but it's my job certainly to come up with the question, and, and, uh, and as somebody who thinks about this, both in a professional setting and a public writing setting, and just thoughts while shaving, so to speak, when I'm pondering the state of my country, I don't know the answer to that question. I really don't. Uh, but I do know the nature of the question and the nature of the problem, and I think in the stronghold and in Whistling Past Dixie, I'm trying to get to the issues of why from either an institutional and structural standpoint or from a partisan and regional standpoint, we have a political system that is dysfunctional in a way that should create uh, concern for all and, and worry for many. So with that, I will stop and I will thank you for making me your speak, featured speaker this year and then uh, we'll take questions, right? Thank you. I'm digging the jackets, by the way. Um, I'll just take turns, so. Hi, I'm Nicholas Fulanagara, a freshman. Yep. And I was wondering what you recommended for people who wanted to become a political scientist like you to do as high schoolers. Wow. Um, the short answer to that question is I don't recommend it. I have college students uh, who look at the job and they think, boy, summer's off, five weeks in January, I still get spring break. Isn't it a nice life to just stand up and pontificate and, and that? Uh, it's a very difficult process to complete a PhD with all due respect, and I'm not saying that to pat myself on the back. You need to really be sure you want to do it and be committed. For every person I know at UNC that made it, I know another who did not. And in some cases spending four, five, or six years on a graduate stipend and working part-time jobs as I did to work their way through and didn't end up in an academic job, uh, didn't end up finishing their PhD. And then even a subset of those who finished their PhDs and didn't get academic jobs is an extraordinarily competitive market. And also because the, you know, the changes in terms of the Kellyizing, if you know what that means of higher education, we increasingly teach classes with adjuncts and there aren't as many full-time tenure track teaching positions uh, like mine, uh, and it's going the way of sort of online universities and these sorts of things. So uh, if you've got the heart for it and you got the guts and you got a great idea and you got some stick to come to UMBC, I'll write you your letter to graduate school. I'd be happy to do it. Uh, but make sure you want it because it's a, it's a difficult road to pay, and frankly, it doesn't pay what going into law or, uh, or business does. Not that money is everything. Uh, happiness is far more important. Uh, I think the thing that I would say that's most important as a precondition for you is a, a real intellectual curiosity. Because if you don't have that, you will not be able to finish a, a dissertation, which is essentially a, a book-length argument that has to be an independent idea or, or thought. And that's a real challenge. But if you have that intellectual curiosity, uh, four or five years from now, from when you're a junior or senior in, in, uh, in uh, undergraduate, pull aside somebody like me, tell them what you just told me, and if they don't uh, deter you, uh, that means they believe in you and they'll write you a nice letter and you can spend the next six years of your life uh, doing that. <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, I'm August Manny. I'm a senior. Um, I read your book, The Stronghold, and if I understand correctly, the consolidation of Republicans in the House means a move away from competitiveness in the presidency. Mm. Um, I was wondering how, whether this a lack of competitiveness will positively or negatively uh, affect the Democrats, the Republicans, and the country as a whole? Well, I mean, that's the central thesis of the book, and it's nicely summarized. Uh, basically, what I'm arguing there is that, uh, and both parties are suffering, I think the Democrats to a lesser degree of this phenomena because of the way the districts are drawn. I mean, increasingly, we have a very much a blue American, a red American. I can just rattle off a few st stats for those who didn't read the book, and including those who did who may not remember. I mean, our, our country is extremely predictable now in its partisan behavior, uh, in part because we have massive data sets that have up to 300 pieces of information on almost every voter uh, who's a regular voter, including what magazines you subscribe to. Uh, it's incredible what they know about you. And they've merged market data that marketers use to sell you peanut butter uh, to sell you presidents. And this is true. And 
as we were talking in Matt's class earlier today, when Bush got reelected in 2004, George W. Bush, uh, 47 of the 50 states voted the exact same way in the Bush Kerry election as they did in the Bush Gore election. Only three states changed Iowa, New Hampshire, and uh, New Mexico. And I thought, well, geez, that's got to be a record that's going to stand for a long time in terms of back to back stability in the Electoral College map until Obama's election and reelection, which only two states changed between 2012, 8 and 2012, Indiana and North Carolina. That tells you that candidates, their issues, their positions, their backgrounds, their biographies, their home states matter less than the prevailing underlying partisan identities of those states. And because of that, because the blue states are in increasingly comfortably blue and the red states are increasingly comfortably red, and because the House districts drawn are similarly uncompetitive, we have increasingly in both chambers of Congress and especially in the House, two sets of very liberal Democrats and conservative Republicans with very little overlap between the two of them, and so it makes it very difficult to solve problems. Now, as to your question, what I am arguing about the Republicans, and there is empirical data to show that the Republicans have moved farther rightward than the Democrats have moved leftward in terms of plotting the votes. This is not my opinion. This is, uh, we have every roll call vote in Congress in the Poole and Rosenthal data set from 1789 till today, and we can track the the patterns of voting by members of both parties for 220 years or whatever we have it for. And what I sort of argue in the book is that because Republicans increasingly come from pretty solid conservative and tend to be whiter states and very solid and conservative in whiter districts, they are talking to a subset of the national population which can nominate them and reelect them in their districts and states, uh, but is not representative of the broader electorate, which of course is getting less white. Um, less married uh, and is less affluent than their home districts. And so the national conversation when you have somebody like a Todd Aiken of Missouri running for Senate or a Christine O'Donnell, what sells in their hometown uh, races in their primaries for a statewide seat or a, a, a district-wide seat in the House, what works for the retail politics back in their district doesn't necessarily sell. And that's why I argue that a congressionalized party tends to suffer in national politics, much as the Democrats who were anchored in the House and the Senate in the 70s and 80s had really bad presidential candidates. And it's not just me. As I quote at the end of the book, Kevin McCarthy, who almost became the speaker after the Republicans lost the 2012 election, said, even though Romney was a former governor, he said, we should never nominate somebody who's only served in the legislature. We should nominate people who have served as governors and mayors, people who have run things and haven't just cast vote and given speeches. And of course, the history bears him out and me out too, right? Obama was a senator, we became president. But prior to that, you got to go back to Kennedy. And prior to that, you got to go back to Harding. Members of Congress win nominations, but they rarely win the presidency. And a party that's too anchored closely to the Congress is going to be a party that has a trouble developing a national message. Thank you. Who do you think will win the Republican nomination, and who will be their vice president? You know, we talked about this uh, at some length after Matt's class. Normally, I have a pretty strong feeling and gut prediction on this. There's, I wrote something for Salon in the first week of March of 2012 saying this election is essentially over. Mitt Romney will be the nominee in February, actually, and Barack Obama will beat him in the general election. Right? Some of the fundamentals of American politics are very easy to predict. Romney led in every appreciable, measurable category. He had the most money, the most uh, endorsements of fellow Republicans. He had the best campaign staff with the most field organizers, the most offices, so forth, and he'd run before. He would have to lose the race and really screw it up to lose it, and he didn't. That was an easy race to pick, and it was a pretty weak field, as it tends to be against incumbent presidents or incumbents of any office because politicians have what's called strategic ambition. They run when the time is right, when somebody's retired or died or is wounded by a scandal or something like that. Smart politicians wait for the better opportunities. That's why we had 17 candidates running at this particular moment, because it's the end of eight years of democratic rule, which goes to the second pattern, and the reason I predicted Obama would win, which is that incumbent presidents in the post-war period have won with the exception of two, and they were challenged in their primary. Carter challenged, uh, was challenged by Kennedy in 1980, and Bush was challenged by Buchanan and others in 1992. Every incumbent president who ran for re-election in the post-war era who was not challenged in his own primary, which meant he went into the general election with a unified party has won, seven for seven, including now Obama. Having said that, who's gonna win this Republican nomination? For the first time, I really have no honest idea. It's a complete puzzlement to me. That was the word we used in the class A. I, I mean, the, the one piece of analysis that I have been saying for a year, although I didn't think it was gonna be Trump and Carson in, in the A bracket here, 
is that there would be a fight between the party, and it was essentially like a tournament where you had two brackets to get to the, semi to the final. And you would have the establishment wing, which was sort of Bush, Kasich, Rubio, Pataki, maybe Scott Walker. He's the only one I wasn't sure which side of the bracket he was on. And then you had the non-establishment. They could be politicians like Cruz, but Trump, Carson, Fiorina. And it would be a fight between the grassroots wing of the party and the establishment wing of the party. And my prediction was whichever side consolidated first and got their candidate in the final would probably win because they'd have unified their side of the bracket. By that logic, it's really two fights right now. It's Trump versus Carson for the anti-politics wing, anti-establishment party, and I guess Bush against Rubio with maybe Kasich, and I'm not sure where Cruz goes and Walker's already dropped out. If you had asked me in August, even in September, when Donald Trump emerged and rose to the top of the polls, I would have said there's no way he's going to be the nominee. I'm not as sure about that. It is November, and even though the Iowa caucuses and the New Hampshire primary are a month later this year in February, I would be more certain if they were in January and we were now only about eight weeks away from the first votes. If Trump is where he is today, one month from today, it's going to be hard to catch him. And by the way, if Trump and Carson combined are at 45 or 50 percent, it's going to be very hard for the Rubio, Bush, Kasich wing to consolidate and still have enough votes there. So this is wide open and I wouldn't bet my mortgage, I wouldn't bet my suit on who's going to win this thing. I have no idea. There are a few people I would bet against. Uh, but. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think it'll be Ben Carson. I do think if it's the non-establishment wing, it'll be Trump. And I do think, I guess, it'll be Rubio or Bush. But I'm not confident in any of those assertions, frankly, any of them. Thank you. Uh, I'm Tobias. I'm a senior. In terms of today's, in terms of the establishment and the system, what do you think the role of higher institutions are? So Harvard, Yale, the Ivies, et cetera, in terms of their law schools and how that's affected the current politicians? Well, Yale's certainly electing a lot of presidents, right? I mean, and they could elect another one here, right? Uh, Carson went to Yale. Uh, our current president went to Yale. Our previous president went to Yale. And the president before him all went to Yale, right? At some level, right? They're all lefties, too. It's like, if you're left-handed, go to Yale, and you've got a basically about a 35% chance of being a future president of the United States. Uh, right? Um, <laughs> it, it, it's clear that our elite institutions have produced the vast majority of our presidents. I think Harvard has produced 10 or 11 presidents alone, and Yale is right behind it. In theory, the future of the country, that should change as increasingly people become more, say, Truman-style presidents who come from our major state universities. Uh, but maybe not. I mean, college education used to be even more elitist than it is today, and it, of course, is still elitist. Uh, in a country where 15 to 25 percent of the freshman classes of the Ivy League schools are legacies, which doesn't mean that those kids aren't smart or didn't have the grades or the board scores to get in, but in a country where we believe it's based on what you did and your skills and accomplishments and not who your parents are, it is a little bit alarming that the freshman classes of our Ivy League institutions, about one out of five, are children of parents who went to those universities. And I realize universities have a vested interest in putting the children of alumni, particularly wealthy alumni, in, in those universities because of the need to raise money for endowments and so forth. But um, there are a lot of alternative solutions about having lottery systems and so forth uh, to, to sort of equalize things. I do think, however, moving forward, this is not the age of you know, Nelson Rockefeller, who graduated from Harvard and spent a year, you know, riding around the world on, uh, you know, Cunard Line ships with his brand new bride and could sort of, was it Dartmouth? I'm so sorry. My apologies. Uh, back in the, well done. Uh, back in those days, people from my family, my generation, my class didn't go to college at all. Now, about 30% of Americans have a college degree. That's a pretty good thing. And the vast majority of them did not go to any of the Ivy League schools. And I realize many of you are destined for that location. And I'm not trying to poor mouth the Ivy League schools, and not only because I didn't go to any of them. I just do think that, in theory, 100 years from now, when somebody's standing at this lectern, we'll have some University of Michigan presidents, besides Gerald Ford, or Missouri State College presidents like Truman. But there'll still be an overrepresentation of Harvard and Yale and Princeton people as well. Thank you. Sir. Uh, hi, I'm Michael Brittingham. I'm a freshman. And my question is, you talked about a third party, a mm -hmm. third alternative party. If that happens in the near future, who could you see leading the movement? And how far left, right, or central would they be? 
Third parties have a pretty poor record in the United States, and you know why? Because of the structural system, right? For those of students who hopefully have learned this, maybe you haven't, we have single member districts with plurality rule. That means one person wins the seat, and the person doesn't even need to get a majority of the vote, 50% plus one. Now, we do have multiple member districts in some of the states, including Maryland, although the number is declining. We're down to about 10 states. And what we know, this is empirically, there's a famous law by a French mathematician from the 1950s called Duverger's Law. We know that single member district systems with plurality rule tend to create and then therefore reinforce two party systems. And the reason is because there's no reward for finishing third or even second. Ross Perot ran for president in 1992 before all of you were born, not all of you, all of you in ties. Uh, and he got 19% of the national popular vote. What percentage of the electoral vote did he get, gentlemen? Zero. Why? Because he didn't finish first in any of the states. And because our state electoral college votes are assigned what? On a winner-take-all basis in almost every state, except for Maine and Nebraska, and it's based on the plurality of the vote. So if you come in first in a state, and Bill Clinton, by the way, in 1992, got a majority of the vote in only two jurisdictions, D.C. and his home state of Arkansas. In every other state, his winning margin was in the 40s, and in a couple states, it was in the 30s because of a three-way race. But you get all the electoral votes. It's winner take all. And that's how we elect almost all of our members of the U.S. House of Representatives and all of our senators. Okay? So if single-member districts with plurality rule tend to create and reinforce two-party systems, it's going to be very difficult, even for a very powerful Perot movement, even for a very powerful Tea Party movement to win any seats. They might endorse Republicans, and they might be Tea Party endorsed Republicans, and we have many of those people who were elected in 2010 and 2012. But there is not a single member who represents the Tea Party, and that is their party of affiliation, right? And those few independents who all have been in the Congress recently, uh, Bernie Sanders, Joe Lieberman, and a few others, are usually people who were in a party and then left and declared an independent. They didn't get elected by a giant party apparatus. In addition and overlaying that, of course, is the two parties do have a duopoly, and they do write the election laws in such a way that it favors, or I should say disfavors, the competitiveness of third parties in terms of ballot access and fundraising, even things down to the presidential debates, which are governed by the two parties and, for the most part, don't allow third party candidates on the stage. So for the short term, and barring a structural change, which would have to happen at the state level to eliminate or alter or do something to affect our uh, single member district plurality rule system which elects the entirety of the presidency if you think about it and almost every house and senate seat except for a couple states that use a runoff election like in Louisiana and Georgia we're going to continue to have a two party system that doesn't mean third party movements and third party supporters don't have any bearing on American politics they do but usually it's to move one of the two major parties the Nader influence on the Democratic Party or the Sanders movement or the Tea Party movement on the Republican Party third party movements, their followers, their politicians, and their elites and leaders and their messages and platforms aren't irrelevant. I never said that. But it's going to be very difficult for them to break through to get power in a strict electoral representational way. I'm Stephen, I'm Stephen Lee. I'm a freshman. Um, you mentioned multiple times in the stronghold uh, Newt Gingrich and his uh, impact on Republicans in the Senate. Uh, do you think uh, he has a Democratic counterpart? Wow, I've given a lot of lectures in this book and nobody's ever asked that question. The question was, is there a Democratic counterpart to Newt Gingrich in terms of his impact on his party's congressional wing, I guess? Wow, Stephen, this is good. Um, no, I can't. Uh, though I reserve the right to answer this question after when I have more time to think about it. I, uh, I can't think of somebody in the modern era, I, there might be some Democratic leaders in the middle of the century, that's a hard, I can't think of somebody who's so revolutionized the congressional wing of the Democratic Party, but maybe I'm failing to think of that person um, at the moment. I mean, Gingrich struck, changed the way the structure of the Congress from the committee systems, the rules, of, the way they broadcast the meetings, uh, the way the Republicans used their congressional power for hearings and so forth. I mean, I wouldn't put Nancy Pelosi in this category. Um, I wouldn't put Harry Reid. I'm trying to even think of people sort of, you know, that are whips below that. I, no, I can't think of anybody. And maybe that testifies to, to Gingrich's enduring influence, which, as I argue in the book, is underappreciated, for better or worse, uh, in terms of being one of the most important politicians in the last 30 or 40 years. Wow, that is a great question. Hi, I'm Sam Bloomberg. I'm a freshman. Uh, I was wondering why you think that Republicans uh, seem to be favoring 
the non-political le- um, candidates like Trump, Carson, and wow. Fiorina? This could be a testament to what I call elite failure, right? And elite failure, by, by the way, doesn't just isn't just limited to our elected officials, right? We've had elite failure in our financial industry. We had elite failure in some cases in our churches. I'll limit my comments to the political class and the governing class, elected or appointed. I I do think there is something wrong in terms of elite failure in this country, and I don't write about this, but other people like John Judas and Christopher Hayes have written books about this problem, that we have a leadership deficit in this country uh, for a variety of reasons that are structural and sociological. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know that the politicians in the Republican Party face this problem any differently from the Demo- politicians in the Democratic Party or their voters, but I do think that for some reason, this sort of anti-elite sentiment, which again, isn't limited to the Republican Party, and, and let me just take a sidebar so I can explain what I mean. We've polled for decades through the Gallup, what is the public approval of institutions, both political institutions and not the church, unions, uh, Congress, the Supreme Court, the media, on and on, right? Historically, we know that there's a hierarchy in the approval ratings of the three elected branches, or the three national branches of, of the constitutionalized government, with the Supreme Court always ranking first, this is still true, and the presidency ranking second, and the Congress ranking last. But what we've also seen is that public regard and trust in those institutions has gone down quite dramatically in the last 30 years, and particularly the last 10 or 15 years. Congress now has approval ratings for the first time, according to Gallup, in single digits. That's how bad it is. And the Supreme Court, which had always been above 50%, is now below 50%. People don't, I mean, citizens, you know, I don't know what it is, but people increasingly don't even trust or have faith in the Supreme Court, okay? And of course, bankers, other institutions also have very low numbers, right? Very low numbers. Why is it affecting the Republican Party a little bit more this time? I don't know, I'm not sure I have the answer, but I'll, I'll venture an educated guess. The Republicans had, I talked about this period of divided government, the Democrats briefly had in the first two years of the Clinton administration, they had the Congress, both chambers, and they had Bill Clinton. But really in the last 20 years, the party that's had unified control of the government for the longest sustained period was the Republicans, right? It was Bush for his first six years, or most had Senate for all but briefly in his first two years. He had the House the entire time, and of course he had the presidency all six years. Republicans had the government lock, stock, and barrel, and many Certainly liberals and Democrats think they did a terrible job of governing, but many Republicans think they did a bad job of governing. And they may think it's bad for different reasons than liberals do. Liberals might think Medicare prescription Part D was a good thing for our senior citizens, but many conservatives think it was a giant government socialist boondoggle and unnecessary addition to the federal deficits and debt. Um, certainly Bush, you know, and the administration didn't acquit itself very well, Katrina and some other sort of short-term disasters and whatever, and we could have a larger argument about how he handled the national security state in the wake of the 9-11 attacks. But many Republicans, in particularly conservative Republicans, felt that George Bush was insufficiently conservative, which liberals and Democrats find a laughable proposition, but is very real to them. And so I think the Republicans are at this moment and especially when they've been mad at outgoing Speaker John Boehner, where they feel like the crisis of confidence in leadership, though it, they certainly have their criticism of Obama and think he's terrible, they are starting at home, I think. And they think, okay, if we're electing our own bad politicians, we really can't elect, we really can't complain about Hillary and Barack being bad if we're electing some people who can't govern either. And so perhaps, to the credit of conservatives and Republicans, they're doing the homework first on their own side, Maybe it's just they think they have bad candidates this year and they want these anti-politics outsiders who haven't governed. Fiorina, Carson, and Trump, who by the way combined are definitely over 50%, right, of the support of self-identified Republicans. The only other thing that I could surmise that might be something working on the right that's not working on the left, working with Republicans, is that the ideological dis- dispositions of the two coalitions of the two parties, and I talk about this in the book. The Republicans are just preternaturally opposed to government so, and use of government as a solution to social and economic problems. They believe in less and limited government, smaller spending, that the government should be reduced, that we should put more power back to the states, which is their belief system, right? And however you, one agrees or disagrees with that belief system, they believe it and they believe it, it's real. So their notion of the need for professional politicians 
is different, I think. Democrats are more inclined to say, oh, this person's served in government for a long time. They're a competent and qualified person. We should elect them to the next level. Whereas Republicans, I think, preternaturally are like, hey, this person managed a business. That sounds good enough for me. Let's, uh, let's let them manage the government. So there's a little bit of a partisan ideological magnifier there that I think Republicans' default might be, hey, you don't have to govern to be a, 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 a president. Um, and of course, if you think that the people who have been elected are doing a terrible job, then it a may be an asset, not just a liability, that you haven't had governing experience. I do think that there's this notion across the aisle and across both parties that our elites have failed us and maybe somebody gets corrupted by going to Washington. You hear that on both sides, but I think it's a little stronger sentiment with the Republicans, and that may explain in part the rise of these anti-politics candidates. Yes, my sir. Name, my name is Cynthia Montgomery, and I'm a freshman. Yep, can you speak up just a drop. Um, what is your opinion on Marco Rubio? Um, mm -hmm. Do you think he could reach out to the Latino vote? Marco Rubio, I mean, the conventional wisdom is that uh, was going to be Bush as the establishment candidate, but he's been a terrible candidate, and so Rubio is now the new fallback position, and that's why you see Rubio attacking Bush and vice versa. They're less interested in Trump because they've got to win their bracket first, right? Uh, whether you subscribe to that analysis or not, I, I, that's what I see going on. Can Rubio branch out? I mean, he's younger. Uh, he's got an interesting story. Uh, nice family. Nice face. Uh, he's a Latino. It'd be a path-breaking moment for the Republican Party to nominate somebody who is not white. Uh, and polls do show, and I do some work with Latino decisions, that uh, Latinos are still net negative on Rubio, but his net negative number is the smallest net negative. Trump's is the largest, no surprising. Trump is like net negative in our uh, new poll from Latinos decisions in Promedia that we just put out this week. I think Trump is negative 52 on Latinos. Rubio is only negative eight. So maybe Rubio is the new Obama for the Republicans, and there's a lot of people who subscribe to that. Um, and maybe he can do it. The downside for Rubio, for those with short memories, and those who read the book know, I talk about Marco Rubio in the first chapter because I say the, the biggest movement since Obama got elected is the Tea Party movement. And one of the major controversies that's defining our modern politics is immigration. And remember, I started writing this book in 2010, 2011. Uh, maybe, no, 2011, 2012. And the person at the intersection of both of those things more than anybody else is Marco Rubio because he supported comprehensive immigration reform in 2013. And now he's trying to pretend he did it. Right, because he needs to win that primary, and he just saw what happened to Trump. He said, build a wall, and the guy went from 2% to 24% in about a month. So Rubio's got a problem to get through the nomination because of his position on immigration originally, and then he's got a problem in the general election, because if I'm Hillary Clinton and I'm standing on the stage next to Marco Rubio, and when the debate question comes up about immigration, as it will, of course, inevitably have to be a question about that, I'm going to turn to Marco Rubio and say, I just want to reach out a hand and say, uh, Democrats like me appreciate the support of our fellow Senator Marco Rubio in supporting amnesty and comprehensive immigration reform and watch all those Trump voters start pulling their Trump-like wigs off their heads, right? I mean, that's what's going to happen. So Rubio might win a nomination that's not worth having. Uh, but can he win? Sure. I think, despite what I just said, he probably is their best chance, though I wouldn't count out Bush. Yes, sir. I'm Logan Paff. I'm a freshman. Um, where do you stand politically, and do you think you carry any of your biases into your books? That's a good question. Uh, my politics are pretty clear because I, until recently, was a columnist for the Baltimore Sun, and I wrote a column there for almost eight years. So my politics, if not already clear, maybe they should be, are liberal uh, and unabashedly. Does it creep into class? I try not to. I'm sure it sneaks in. And when I say, listen, I'm going to put my opinion in, I clearly signpost it. Students already know what my positions are because it's easy to Google me and find out where I stand on that. I mean, this is a big concern that you hear, and in, in, frankly, in right-wing talk radio and stuff. I'd be happy to put any of my tests online for people to look at. There's not a single partisan or ideological. There's not a single opinion question. I grade students on how they think, not what they think. And some of my best students, including my, the student I hired to be my um, researcher for Whistling Past Dixie was Sean Latanish and might be the single most conservative student I've had in 18 years at UMBC. So I care about the quality of your work and research and like I said, how you think, how your mind works and your capacity for critical thinking and reading and writing more than where you come out on the back end. Uh, my positions in politics have changed. I was president of college Republicans when I was a little older than you. I was a kind of a George H.W. Bush was one of my early heroes. I was kind of a moderate Republican who was left on social issues and more conservative on, on economic issues, and I just feel like I have moved some to the left, but the 
Republican Party moved to the right, and at some point in the mid-90s, uh, though I didn't vote for Clinton either time, uh, we passed in the night. And so I cast my first Democratic vote for president for Al Gore in 2000. I, people ask me who I vote for. I don't say I, it's my business. I'm perfectly happy to be straightforward and let people judge my comments accordingly and discount if they feel the need to. But yeah, I have some great students of all ideological persuasions. College students are a little bit more liberal than conservative, I think it's fair to say. These things go in trends. When I was in college in the 80s, I think students were a little more conservative than they are today. It'll probably come back around a little bit. Um, but, you know, we go at it in class, and a lot of times, frankly, I'm the one arguing just to play devil's advocate because the students are uh, more liberal on average than they are conservative, or there's more liberals than conservatives in a typical classroom. I often find myself picking apart their arguments, even though I'm agreeing with, I personally agree with them, just to see if they know what they're talking about. Because I have much more respect for somebody who disagrees with me and knows why than somebody who agrees with me and doesn't. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Sean Kim. I'm a freshman, and in your book, you mentioned this concept of houseifying the Senate, mm -hmm. and I was wondering whether this, um, whether the Senate will become unreliable in its um, role to, as we discussed, in class, to cool down the House. Yeah. Uh, yes, of? yes, is the short answer to that question. Uh, for those who didn't read the book, uh, what I did was I tracked, and this is a little bit true for the Democrats, but especially true for the Republicans, and this is just a simple tally. I looked at every year after the Republicans captured Congress, Senate back from Democratic control. So they recaptured the Senate in 1952 when Eisenhower won, so I looked at the 83rd Congress, I believe it is. They recaptured it when Reagan was president, initially elected in 1980, so whatever that Congress was, or the 92nd or something, in 1981. They recaptured it again, obviously, in the Republican Revolution of 1994, the infamous or famous 104th Congress with Gingrich. And then they recaptured it again after temporarily losing it with the 2002 election after Jeffords switched. And I looked at the share of Republicans in the new majority who had served in the House previously. And for those who read the book, they know that in the 50s it was 20%, and then in the 80s and 90s it was around 30%, and then it got to 49%. And now with the new Congress that just got installed in the 114th Congress, with six former House members, Republican House members, getting elected to the Senate, they are now a majority. There are 30 out of 55 U.S. Senators in the Republican Caucus who are former U.S. House members. Now, my political science colleague who's written a definitive book on this called The Gingrich Senators, which is cited in there, his name is Sean Theriot, he looked at the voting behavior and this polarization, and what he basically demonstrated by looking at the roll call votes of the Senators is he, he basically argued and concluded that the ideological polarization, not that this hasn't happened with the Democrats and the liberals on the left, but the movement of the Republicans to the right in the Senate is almost completely attributable to the election and the voting patterns of senators who were former House members, who came of age in the House, and that much more acerbic, polarizing politics. And so, yes, I do think the historical function, the founder's vision of the Senate as the saucer that cools the hot passions, is the metaphor you correctly used, of the saucer, saucer cooling the hot uh, passions of the teacup in the House, that function is disappearing. And we are getting a Senate that, let's be clear, is not as polarized, both in the distance and the numbers, in the voting records, as the House, but is moving in that direction. Good question. Gentlemen, I'm conscious of time. So uh, Stephen and Robert, why don't you guys be, be the last two, two questions, and then we'll call them next. Thank you. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Robert Lee. I'm a senior. Uh, last month, uh, the House of Representatives passed uh, Export-Import Bank uh, in an overwhelming vote. Um, but after, right after that, uh, S Senator Mitch McConnell said he does not agree with it. What does it mean to, uh, between the relationship of establishment and the Tea Party in the Senate? Hmm. I, I don't know about that particular vote because most votes in both the Senate and the House are what's called party line votes where 90% of Democrats vote together and on the opposite direction, I or nay, from 90% of Republicans. The more interesting, so it's actually both unusual, it's like seeing a you know, snow leopard or something, these kind of votes where they're unified that are not symbolic votes like you know, recognizing the national basketball champion resolutions and stuff. Major policies where the two parties are relatively unified are increasingly rare. And so it's normally in the heavily divisive votes, particularly where there's peeling off uh, on an issue like uh, trade partnership or the government bailout after the economic crisis, where Republicans and Democrats, were, some of them were voting together, uh, but opposite from each other, where we had a divided vote, but we had a mixed coalition. 
right? It's less interesting when they're all voting the same, and it's kind of less interesting when the Democrats are here and all the Republicans are over here. What's interesting is when we have a divided Congress, but it doesn't line up along party lines. So on that particular one, I don't know the answer to your question. I think the more challenging votes that we've seen are fights over the debt ceiling, the government shutdowns, where either on the Senate side, they were a test of McConnell's leadership and the ability to keep his Senate delegation together as people like Cruz were fighting against him internally. And then uh, conversely, uh, votes where our recently departed Speaker John Boehner was doing everything in his powers to keep his House caucus. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't really have a, an educated opinion on export import in this particular case. I'm sorry. Last question. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Stephen Smellis, and I'm a senior. Um, <clears throat> Uh, earlier in your speech, you uh, you said uh, you said something about uh, having to look at uh, how our founders uh, our founders uh, how uh, our our political Jesus. Uh, take, take your time. <laughs> it's all good. How the founders constructed the government? How, yeah, how the founders constructed the government. I was wondering. Um, or why they wore powdered wigs and leggings? No, no, the first. Both one. legitimate questions. Um, I was wondering what you thought about the Electoral College because I know that ah. that part part the main reason for its existence is that the founders uh, didn't trust the American people to uh, elect the president. That's I right. The question is uh, okay. Is that it? I thought. Uh, what was your opinion about whether we should go to a majority vote or not? I, I would like to have a national popular vote for president. And let me just remind or inform people who may not know this because most Americans don't know this. The Electoral College as conceived by the founding fathers in Philadelphia in the hot leggings wearing, wig wearing summer of 1787 was not designed to be the institution it is today which is to say the general election decision mechanism. The founding fathers believed that in a presidential election a whole bunch of candidates would run representing mostly geographic interests, right? We had no parties at this point. It was all the candidates ran as Democratic Republicans, the Federalists initially, and the Democratic Republicans, right? Go back and look at the Jefferson election of 1800. All four candidates are from the same party, right? The notion there was that uh, economic interest, regional interest, that, you know, Southern Plantation would have different views than a Boston, you know, sea merchant, right? And we'd have five, six, seven candidates, and each of them would carry their state, maybe a couple of neighboring states, and none of them would get a majority. And the Electoral College requires a majority of electoral votes as the sufficient condition to get elected president, but it's not a necessary condition if you know the difference between the two. If no candidate gets a majority of the popular vote, what happens to the selection of the president? It gets thrown into the House of Representatives. And so what the founding fathers thought they were creating was essentially, again, this is the pre-party era, a primary mechanism that would narrow the candidates down and then other elites in the House of Representatives, chosen by state elites, not themselves elected by the popular vote, in many cases, in most states, would pick the presidency, right? And this is at a time when suffrage was limited to essentially propertied white men to begin with. That was as far as suffrage went. And for the federal government, meant only electing the House, right? The senators were pop chosen by the state legislatures. The Supreme Court was appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate as it still is today. And the president was going to be chosen with this electoral college winnowing mechanism, but ultimately back in the House. And the electoral college would be chosen by state elites, right? There was no popular votes to determine electoral college votes like we do today. So we have a very, I mean, like, we're not just driving around like a Chevy Vega here, right? We're driving around a horse and buggy is the appropriate metaphor. This is an antiquated vehicle for a modern democracy in my view. Now, does it mean it fails every time? Of course not, right? I mean, in most elections, the popular vote winner wins the election. And that people say, well, that's all we really need. Now, that doesn't happen every time, as Gore and Andrew Jackson and Samuel Tilden and, and uh, Grover Cleveland all know, right? Those are four presidents who came first in the popular vote and did not become president in that election, at least. More to the point, and because it's a series of statewide elections, and because of what I told you earlier about red states being red and blue states being blue, and there's not a lot of mobility or change in the states, the vast majority of Americans aren't effectively participating in the presidential election, right? Including in our own state. Because we know from the sophistication of voter targeting and information and so forth, that no Democrat is going to carry Alaska this cycle and no Republican is going to carry, you know, Massachusetts or Maryland. Very unlikely, right? And so elections right now, even though 120 million people may vote, we really have an election that's down to about 10 or 12 states and only not all the people in those states, only about 10 or 12 million people in those states. And so I'm for a national popular vote, and I'm for the national popular vote plan, if you're not familiar with that, and about nine or 10 states have signed it, including Maryland. And I won't bore you with the details of that, but it basically 
would create a compact where if enough states with 270 electoral votes agree to it, they would vote for the national popular vote winner even if there's that candidate didn't carry their state. And so the national popular vote winner would always have 270 electoral votes. And one of the main advocates of it is uh, running for the House seat in 8th District, Jamie Raskin, who's written about it publicly in Slate and other places. So if you're interested in that as an alternative, I'm a supporter of that. And we basically would guarantee that the, whoever got the most votes wins. Thank, Thank you. you.